Many of our community members live uh, on, on that side. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost like an extension of Wistigooch in a sense. Tonight, a First Nation in Quebec is given passes to cross the bridge to New Brunswick, but they want full access again. When schools are open and I have a food bank for children so they can kind of just grab food and leave for lunch or evenings. And schools closed in Calumet, but what about the breakfast program kids rely on? Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. In Ottawa today, MPs highlighted the vulnerability of Indigenous women during this pandemic. And APTN asked Prime Minister Justin Trudeau about First Nations who want to stay on lockdown, even as the provinces begin easing restrictions. Jamie Pasha-Gumskum reports. In the House of Commons today, NDP MP Lindsay Matheson highlighted how the pandemic leaves Indigenous women vulnerable and called for faster work implementing the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, 231 calls for justice. The report from the National Inquiry must not sit on the shelf. The government needs to work in partnership with Indigenous women, the families of murdered and missing, and the communities to implement the inquiry's call for justice and the calls to action brought forward by communities. Green Party MP Paul Manley said one call for justice in particular would go a long way for Indigenous women, a guaranteed annual living income. But for many women and children, home is not a safe place at the best of times. Social isolation, financial difficulties and alcohol consumption have all contributed to an increase in violence against women and children. Also in the House of Commons today, Conservative MP Pierre Paulus objected to the checkpoint in Ganesatagi. He said it is negatively affecting families in Oka. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller responded, saying the matter falls under provincial jurisdiction. APTN asked Justin Trudeau today if he supports Indigenous communities' efforts to remain on lockdown. Local jurisdictions will have to make very careful decisions about how and where to uh, reopen. And we need to make sure that every step of the way, people are working with all local stakeholders, including and specifically uh, Indigenous communities and leadership, to ensure that we're not bringing in greater risks. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. A Mi'kmaq First Nation in Quebec is being refused access to their ancestral lands in nearby New Brunswick because of COVID-19 concerns. But with few cases in the region and none in the community, the hope is that an exception will be made. Tom Fenario has that story. This is the J.C. Van Horn Bridge. Thousands of cars use it to cross from New Brunswick to Quebec every day, or used to use it. Currently, it's close to all but essential traffic. To cut it off, um, arbitrarily without discussion of how do we work as a region I think is is, is wrong. It, it doesn't reflect how we operate. It doesn't reflect our reality. That reality for Chief Darcy Gray of Listigush First Nation is simple. Much of his community of about 2,000 located in eastern Quebec travels five minutes to Campbellton, New Brunswick daily. Groceries, school, Listigush is so intertwined with Campbellton they use Atlantic time instead of the eastern time zone that the rest of Quebec uses. Many of our community members live uh, on, on that side, um, you know, it, it's it's almost like an extension of Listigooch in a sense. Gray says the next closest large grocery market is 55 kilometers away, an area where cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed. New Brunswick has made a compromise to Listigooch. Ten dashboard passes have been created to allow Listigooch members to cross over for two hours. Gray says there's been some social media backlash from their neighboring Quebec community regarding what's viewed as a privilege. Um, you know, that, that didn't go over well. Um, we were concerned that people going into Camelton with passes would almost be going with a, a target on their back. Gray has reason to believe there's unrest brewing. About 400 locals from both sides of the border gathered Monday on the bridge to protest its continued closing. On May 15th, Gray wrote a letter to New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs requesting a meeting with him and local municipalities to look for a solution. Almost a week later, at Wednesday's press conference, Higgs said he has not read the letter. There may be discussions going on with public safety in relation to what they're actually asking for, but to have a, um, a wholesale movement back and forth, uh, I think would be risky for us and risky for, for them as well at this stage. New Brunswick hasn't had a case of COVID-19 for two weeks. Nobody in Listigush has tested positive either. In that spirit, Gray hopes that there could be a gradual reopening soon. We need to work together. Uh, solutions that divide us uh, aren't, aren't, aren't helping anybody. 
Tom Fenerio, ABTN National News, Montreal. A stone's throw from Montreal, which is still grappling with active COVID-19 outbreaks. The Mohawk community of Ganawage extended its state of emergency for another month. The move was unanimously approved by Chief and Council. The community's COVID-19 task force will continue its work ahead of Ganawage's tentative June 1st reopening. Businesses in Montreal are geared to reopen this week. Despite the city's 22,000 cases, Ganawage says doing things right will take time. That's a, 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 um, a good indicator, maybe, to, to the community, you know, to saying that, you know, as much as we talk about um, moving forward and, and developing and, and evolving, you know, that we're definitely in this for the long haul. An Ochi Cree politician in Ontario says the province must consult with First Nations before opening up the north. Listen to MPP saw Mamakwa raised concerns in the legislature on Tuesday. Provincial Health Minister Christine Elliott said the province has spoken with First Nations leaders and Ontario has allocated $37 million to the pandemic response for First Nations communities. Mamakwa says that's not enough and that long-standing needs must be considered. The water crisis, uh, the housing crisis, um, the suicide crisis, mental health crisis, those issues, they don't understand that. And, uh, and I, that's what I mean. Like, it's almost like as if we're not part of Ontario when they, want, when they, want, when they, when they don't want to invest in the, uh, have these direct investments into, right into the community. Um, you know, it's, um, and I think that's uh, understanding that, uh, you know, uh, and that's why they're not opening up because they want to protect, that's like their isolation, their uh, remoteness or their, uh, uh, is one of the tools that First Nations have, communities, communities have. We have to take a break, but coming up, a mother's journey to Vancouver's downtown east side during the pandemic to save her daughter from drug addiction. On the east coast, we've got 5 in rain in St. John's Sunshine and 16 for Halifax. 12 and mostly sunny for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Kujuak 0 and snow. Shibugamu 23 and sunny skies, 21 and sunny for Quebec City. London 19 and sunny, Sault Ste. Marie 18 and sunny skies. Sunshine and 26 for Sioux Lookout, 24 for Campus Casing. Puckatawagan 9 and sunny, God's Lake sunshine and 18 degrees. 27 and uh, sunshine for Winnipeg, 28 with some rain later for Brandon. Swift Current, 25, nope, 19 and rain, Saskatoon, 20 and rain. 13 and sunny for Stony Rapids, 15 and some rain for L'Orange. This next story is about a mother and her determination to save her daughter who is an addict living on Vancouver's downtown east side during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tina House brings you Faith's story. A warning, this story contains graphic images and content that may be disturbing to some viewers. Faith Rose Alexis was born on March the 8th, 1982 in Bella Coola, BC. Her mother, Mavis Benson, was just 16 years old at the time. Being really young and naive, I, I just didn't know what I, what I was in for, you know. And after the labor, I was just so exhausted. And she was a beautiful little baby. And, you know, I just totally fell in love with her when she was born. Soon after Faith was born, Mavis became a single mom and moved back to their community, the Cheslata First Nation, near Burns Lake, B.C. Faith's grandparents helped raise her while Mavis finished school. It was the stability in Faith's young life that she yearned for, and she thrived as she learned about her culture. She knows how to snare rabbits. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> she actually showed me. She would snare rabbits. She would um, help him, help my mom, um, you know, cut up the moose. She knows how to do the dry meat. She knows how to do dry fish. She knows how to cut it up. She knows all our, our traditional culture really, really well and being close to her grandma was the most important thing in her life. Her mom says Faith wanted to become a movie star and a model. She was excited for her future. 
In 2002, she even attended the American Indian Film Festival in San Francisco, California to pursue her goals. And then she wanted to go to Hawaii to see the world. She was a beautiful girl. She was always energetic and full of life, and she just loved life. She used to do everything that she could. She was just excited for life every single day. 18 years after that trip to Hawaii, this is Faith today, nearly unrecognizable. She is now 38 years old and has lived down here on Vancouver's downtown east side since 2008. Severely addicted to drugs, she lives in a single room occupancy room on Vancouver's East Hastings Street. Mavis says Faith got into pills and alcohol when she was about 16 when they moved to Vancouver. In her early 20s, she got sober and had four children. She left the father of her children because she claims he was abusive. She tried hard to raise her kids on her own, but Mavis says she suffered from postpartum depression. So Mavis took custody of three of her grandkids while the youngest was adopted. And then Mavis says Faith's world turned upside down when her beloved grandmother Mary passed away. When her grandma passed away, her, her world was taken from her. It's another rainy day in Vancouver, and Mavis and her friend Marlene Jack are out once again looking for Faith. It's something she's had to do over the years. Because of Faith's addiction, she doesn't always stay in contact. Except this time, there's more of an urgency. With the COVID-19 pandemic, she's scared and worried for her safety especially living here on Vancouver's downtown east side, where social distancing orders are not being followed. She does have a lot of mental health issues, and she needs to be in a safe environment like that, especially with the pandemic. Mavis agreed to wear a GoPro camera for this story, and hours into her search, she finds Faith on East Hastings Street, outside of the SRO where she lives. Hi, Faith. Hi. Oh, Mom, is that you? Yes. Oh, hi, Mom. Hi, baby. Hi. Faith says she has just returned from the hospital and claims that she was tested for COVID-19. However, she was discharged even though she has gaping open wounds on both her arms and hands. How come they didn't even look at your arms and wrap your arms? No, I know, I know, I know. But they didn't anyway. They discharged me. They told me they were like, clock it's worth to come back. Do you sound pretty bad? Yeah. Faith is just now one of the thousands of people who are living in poverty, and down here, addiction is just a way of life. She agreed to be filmed to show the reality of what it's like living in places like this. Hey, my girl. Hi. What's your light? Oh. oh yeah. For Faith, years of addiction and not taking care of herself has resulted in poor health and a weak immune system, making her a perfect target for COVID-19. This is Faith's room. It's infested with bed bugs and cockroaches and piles of garbage and clothes. The shower is totally filled with clothes and debris, making it unusable. Oh Look at that. Oh my goodness. Admittedly heavily addicted to drugs and dealing with mental illness, every day it's the same, finding drugs and doing drugs. For addicts like her, the pandemic has changed everything and basic frontline services are no longer available. Making it more dangerous for addicts because of the no visitor policy means she can't use the buddy system and the chances of overdosing alone in her room are high. For Mavis, it was on one of those visits with Faith that she had a lucid moment and she was able to ask her about going to treatment. Do you think I'd want to go to treatment? I don't know, what do you think about it? I think you should, because I'm really worried about you. I really love you, and I want you to come home to us. I want you to live with us. What would Grandma say if she was here? Grandma wouldn't like you down here, would she? No. It's been a really difficult struggle for Mavis all these years, as she herself is a residential school survivor, and her parents are also residential school survivors. Mavis fears that Faith has inherited that intergenerational trauma. 
I just feel like she's... She's dead inside. You know, when I go see her and I talk to her, she's just absolutely dead. It's not the faith that I knew, you know? It's not the faith that I raised. After months of advocating for her daughter, Mavis was finally able to get Faith's psychiatrist to certify her under the Mental Health Act, which means police can pick up Faith to take her to the hospital. Mavis has been calling the police every day for the last two weeks to go get her, but so far, they haven't. So, she keeps trying. Well, basically, the police haven't picked her up yet. She is in her room now. And finally, on April the 10th, she was admitted to St. Paul's Hospital. Now, it's a fight to keep her in there, at least until her wounds heal, and hopefully she agrees to go to treatment. Meanwhile, Mavis received funding from her band to hire a hazmat team to clean Faith's room to the cost of $3,800. The stress of it all has taken its toll on Mavis. I'll never leave her. I just need her to know that. And I'll, I'll always be here for her. And I love her no matter what. And then there it was, mixed in amongst a pile of debris in Faye's room. Mavis found a poem that her daughter wrote. Could it finally be the answer to so many of her questions about how did it get so bad for her daughter? And here on this beautiful beach at sunset, Mavis finally found the strength to read Faith's heartfelt words. When my grandma died, so did I. My world, my heart, my soul she was. Grandma, please come back. I will follow you only. No more lonely road. No more noise. No more anger. And no more self-hate in my head. I will pull through. I will. I hear karma calling. It's bad, because I'm bad. I'm confused. I don't know why. I had no choice to be here. There was no exit button. None. There's still no exit button. So please don't come here. Please, please don't come here. For now, Faith remains in hospital, sober and COVID free at the moment. And as the sun sets on another day, Mavis prays her daughter finally gets the help she so desperately needs. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. We've got to take a break, but there's more news still ahead, so stay with us. Let's go to northern Alberta, where we've got 60 to rain for high level in Peace River, 10 in rain for Grand Prairie, 9 and rain for Edmonton, 12 in rain for Lethbridge, 16 in rain for Kamloops, 16 in sunny for Quinell. Port Nelson, rain in 7 degrees, Prince Rupert, 11 in cloudy skies. 19s for Dawson City and Beaver Creek, sunny skies there. Wrigley, mix the sunny cloud and 11 degrees. Yellowknife, sunny and 13. Inuvik, 5 and sunny. Politek, 5 and sunny. Minus 1 and snow for Baker Lake. For Chesterfield, 0 and snow. Cape Dorset, 0 and snow. Same with the Calouite. And minus 2 and snow in Pangerton. Welcome back. 70% of Nunavut Inuit school kids go hungry at some point of the year, 25% of them regularly. Many Nunavut schools run breakfast programs and food banks to help. So what happened when COVID-19 forced school closures? People found new ways to help. This is from Iqaluit. It never gets this quiet at the Jomi school. At least, it didn't until COVID-19 measures closed the playgrounds and the schools. Nunavut schools don't just teach. For many, 
It is the place they go where they know there will be something to eat. Jason Rochon is a student support assistant at Akalowitz Jomi Elementary School. I run a breakfast program already when schools are open and I have a food bank for children so they can kind of just grab food and leave for lunch or evenings and I know how much they use those kind of programs. And no school means, no school breakfast and no school food bank. So Rashawn got together with friends, got $25,000 from the Territorial Inuit Association, some donated warehouse space and started handing out breakfast bags. And we thought breakfast in a bag would be safest because we could assemble it and just there'd be less contact and we could do a lot of social distancing and make sure anybody who wanted breakfast could have access to breakfast. All over Nunavut, other communities are doing the same. In Arctic Bay, a nearby mining company donated caribou. Residents made soup to distribute. They're doing breakfast bags too. Arctic Bay has 300 students. They're giving out 200 breakfast bags a day. Back in Iqaluit, the program is being well used. There are just over 1,300 students in Iqaluit. One day, one day we had 549, one day we had 200, some days we have 400, some days 180. It depends on the wind and the weather. The 25 grand from NTI only goes so far. They've received donations of all sizes from all over to keep this pop-up breakfast program going. There is some hope for the future, though. The federal government added $25 million to the Nutrition North food subsidy for remote communities as a COVID-19 response. Since they did, the price of four liters of milk in a calorie has dropped from $8.99 to $4.99, nearly in half. If they can half the price of milk during a crisis, imagine what they could do if they applied that thinking to Nunavut's ongoing food crisis. Until then, the schools will have to keep feeding the children whether or not the schools are open. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. There are a lot of emotions that people are feeling because of this pandemic, but one not talked about enough or maybe misunderstood is the sense of grief that we feel in various ways for various reasons since COVID-19 hit. Here's a look at some of that discussion we had this on this afternoon's In Focus. It's usually, um, unfortunately, uh, this sort of um, uh, ripple effect in the community that ends up being, uh, you know, young people and uh, and the stages are, are back and forth where you might go from uh, depression, which which you don't even identify that it's depression mm -hmm. uh, until it's too late. And then uh, you're back and forth between a, this pendulum. And I think there's a real stigma, unfortunately, still in, the, in this country. And I think one of the problems is, is that grief is not seen uh, as, as a mental health issue. And, and there's no, you know, I, I think uh, services that are covered in terms of, of grief. And so people are really sort of left on their own. And when you don't have the ability, uh, at least for Indigenous people, and, and I'm sure for others, there's no real ability to, you know, rely on um, the processes, the, the community processes, that they normally would uh, uh, rely on or the rituals. Be sure to check out APTN News Facebook page where you can watch that episode right now. We're all out of time for your news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.